Good evening, this is Brass Tax. I'm Zaka Jacob. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on the campaign trail over the weekend on more than one occasion compared the Congress's manifesto to a document inspired by the Muslim League. He claims that it was partisan, it was communal and it caters to the needs and aspirations of just one community, the minority Muslim community. The Congress party is hit back saying that whatever is there in the manifesto is only meant for the upliftment of minorities who are one of the poorer sections of society. Congress's Jairam Ramesh has gone to the extent of saying that it was the Hindu Mahasabha, the precursor to the modern-day BJP and RSS, which had actually teamed up with the Muslim League much before independence in provinces like Sindh and Bengal. So the question is, in 2024, in the campaign to elect the next government, the 18th Lok Sabha as it were, who exactly is bringing historic references and who exactly is playing politics here? We'll get to that and more in just a bit. But first, the story of how the Muslim League politics is now resonating on the campaign trail because of the Congress's manifesto and the BJP from the Prime Minister downwards deciding to make this an election issue. कांग्रेस ने जो घोषणा पत्र बनाया है उसमें भी मुस्लिम लीग की छाप है साथियों कांग्रेस को आज भी देश के लोगों की जरूरत से कोई लेना देना नहीं है जिस तरीके की रणनीति और राजनीति कर रहे हैं और तुष्टिकरण की राजनीति कर रहे हैं देश ने इनको माफ नहीं किया है और आगे भी माफ नहीं किया It was not the Congress party which was in bed with the Muslim League. It was the, Bar the founder of the Bharati Jansa. But the real reason for the target is to rewrite the constitution. I mean, is this a language that behooves the Prime Minister? All right, so let's take you through this clash that has now erupted in the wake of the Congress's manifesto. The BJP is saying this is similar to a Muslim League document and this is pure appeasement politics. So let's break it down for you. What does the manifesto say and what is the BJP's counter to it? The Congress's manifesto says the party if elected will ensure that minorities have the freedom of choice when it comes to dress, food, language and personal laws. The BJP is countering that by saying the Congress will not support the Uniform Civil Code and it only will continue with binary laws if the Congress supports UCC one wouldn't have to explicitly say that they will support the freedom of choice when it comes to dress, food, language, etc. The Congress's manifesto says they will restore the Maulana Azad scholarship for studying abroad and also increase scholarship for minority students. The BJP's counter is that this is active discrimination on the basis of religious lines and that too in a sensitive area like education. The Congress's manifesto says that the Congress will ensure that banks and non-banking financial institutions will provide institutional credit to minorities, loans if you will, without any discrimination. The BJP's counter to that is that bank credit has also now been communalized by the Congress party. The Congress's manifesto says if elected they will ensure that minorities get opportunities in all sectors without discrimination. The BJP is saying that this is nothing but a tacit promise to provide quotas on the basis of religion, which of course the Constitution of India explicitly uh, denies or explicitly says that can't be the case. The manifesto says that economic empowerment of minorities is crucial for the overall growth of the country. The BJP's counter to that is that minorities are the biggest beneficiaries of the Modi government's welfare schemes and it has challenged the Congress party and other opposition parties to show that there's been any discrimination when it comes to Labharti politics, which the Modi government has practiced over the last 10 years. So, the question is, who is playing politics and is this the issue that's going to dominate the 2024 campaign cycle? Here in our studios, I'm joined by Smita Prakash, editor of ANI. Swapandas Gupta is leader of the BJP, former Rajya Sabha member of parliament. Mohan Kumar Manglam is spokesperson of the Congress party. Nidja Chaudhary, senior journalist uh, who's tracked the last 10 Lok Sabha elections. Let me start with you, Smita Prakash. The Congress is saying, look at what our manifesto is saying, restoring Maulana Azad scholarships, economic empowerment of minorities, ensure that banks provide institutional credit. 
what is so discriminatory what is so muslim league about this i really don't asking. know i think it's it's uh, a kafafal really um going back again uh, it's more of a trading of words and a war of words between the two uh, and uh, because of the focus on minorities in the congress uh, manifesto it's like a red rag to uh, the bjp so they are of course going to pick on that issue and now today we've been seeing since yesterday in fact for the past 24 hours we've been seeing history lessons which have been going on from uh, going back to uh, savarkar and then you're going back to quitlim league and uh, some even saying uh, going back to the lal bal pal of our history lessons you know uh, the entire uh, uh, discussion has become so murky to me i think uh, what what the bjp should have picked on which they haven't is about the redistribution of wealth, wealth. which uh, rahul gandhi mentions uh, and it's talked about in the manifesto i think that should have been something the bjp should have picked up instead it has gone into its um, what everybody thought it would which is the muslim league so is, is this then an attempt at pol politicizing this issue to the extent that the bjp wants to paint the congress as a muslim party and wants to paint itself as a hindu party well you know when a manifesto is brought out it's inevitable and in inescapable that it's going to be politicized after all this is all about politics mm -hmm. so here you had two aspects in which the Cong uh, the congress manifesto could have been attacked one is not necessarily for what it has said but what it can imply and it's there this overbearing thing on minorityism hmm. and that is a very easy stick to beat the congress with you know then the congress goes on to say that you know there is rahul gandhi's thing that india is not a nation but a union of states and it goes into this almost a quasi confederal setup which it advocates now that's a very easy one to beat and that's why the muslim league illusion has been brought in into this picture now no, the congress's contention is this minority section is just one page out of some 45 pages no, that they true, have in there you know but you know, i mean okay but in in in, in the past article 370 was one clause in an entire <laughs> manifesto or the ram mandir was also one clause so the it's not like, also <laughs> one sentence exactly okay. so it's yeah. not that's not the issue you know it's a question of you remember manmohan singh's very or rather infamous statement that all the resources of the nation first right, to first right of the, all the resources should go to the minority and that is the baggage which the congress still carries and no wonder the bjp is attacking it for that and therefore it's almost taunting the congress to say say that you don't believe that and the congress won't be able to say that because the congress is also hedging the congress is also giving conflicting ambivalent signals to its core support base so so let, let me ask mohan kumar mangalam the spokesperson of the congress party i mean the similarities between the congress manifesto's language and the muslim muslim league resolution back from the 1940s uh, this is what the congress manifesto says and i quote we will encourage reform of personal laws with the concern, uh, consent of all concerned communities the muslim league resolution back from the 40s says no bill shall be passed if three fourth members of any community oppose for interests of the said community the bjp's contention is in a democracy can there be a greater argument for a uniform civil court if all indians all citizens are equal before the law as per article 14 and 15 then why why isn't the congress party uh, uh, supporting a uniform civil court why should it be left to the consent of the community concerned saka i think the congress has made it clear in its manifesto that everyone has a right to follow their personal laws how form in personal laws of everyone's own religions and i think once those laws are reformed by listening to more progressive voices from those communities then it won't be too far a, you know a journey to get to a uniform civil court frankly i think how you get to that point is important i don't think you should ride roughshod over anyone's beliefs anyone's personal religion based practices in order to get to some sort of utopian state that you believe and whose laws are going to be imposed on someone else so i think the what congress has done is taken a very sort of democratic view here in saying that let us help them reform their personal laws or we will encourage them to reform their personal laws first of all the if you want to talk about the muslim laws they're not even codified yet so codify those laws first 
after you reform them and then i'm pretty sure we can get to a uniform civil code without much of a hullabaloo that's happening like the bjp would like for it to be but but mohan the point that sobhandas gupta and the bjp are making is why do you even have a section for the minorities you don't have a section in your manifesto saying this is what we will do for the majority community isn't the whole manifesto about the majority then the minorities together and aren't minorities if you go back to the sacha committee report one of the most downtrodden sections of our society why was the minority scholarship taken away to begin with this is about empowering different sections and why is the bjp only picking on minorities why isn't it picking on the obc uh, reservation that we're talking about because they are this is their standard play right as smita said they been everyone would expect the bjp to target the manifesto and try to use it to say that they are in the hindu party and the congress is a muslim party but i think people are tired of this rhetoric one page in a manifesto that basically talks about things like an apprenticeship model along the germ german apprenticeship mo- apprenticeship model lines that talks about you know empowering women by giving them a stipend every year that counts okay. about 1 lakh a month we have like major 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 initiatives in that manifesto and to pick up one page and talk about it is frankly ridiculous and the bjp could never so, talk about redistribution the way smita says they should because then they would come out being anti poor and that's not something they can afford any more so of so let me ask nirja choudhury this is this as mohan kumar mangalam and the congress would have you believe you know the bjp just talking up an issue because it suits them it suits them to polarize it and to communalize it they've taken one page out of 45 and said that look congress is a muslim party and it reeks of a muslim league mindset is this issue relevant at all in 2024 or is the congress simply missing the point that they are not able to convey to a large majority of the people of this country the perception rightfully or wrongly that the bjp has made about the congress that it caters more to the minorities than to the majority i think you know the fact that the prime minister is pitching it so high and repeatedly at his rallies mm-hmm. and it's very strong language he is used this time you know comparing it to muslim league politics which was a creation of a, a, a different state on the basis of religion which india opted against at the time of independence so uh, it is uh, you know it is of course it's a tried and tested method of the bjp to polarize the situation along hindu muslim lines and it gets the natural advantage because the hindu consolidates behind it and now with the ram mandir the prime minister has also talked about the uh, congress not going for the consecration of the temple and uh, expelling people who uh, went there and so on so uh, it is that hindu muslim divide coming to the fore again we we'll probably see even more strident voices in the coming days they may have a point say on uniform civil code you know there's a commitment okay. in the constitution towards a, civil, a uniform civil code <laughs> and i remember writing 35 years ago 30 more than 30 years ago after the shabanu judgment about uh, absolutely the line of the congress party that is the reform in personal law should be done with the consent of the community that's a normal democratic way to go but then if three four decades have come you come down the line at that reform initiative has not been taken so mm. far Mm-hmm. then you can raise that question you the bjp can certainly raise the question in our labharti scheme we've not discriminated against a muslim that's a fact they have not said because you're a muslim you will not get the benefit and yet it's also a fact that the muslim community in india today is beleaguered it feels insecure and many people of course say the prime minister if he comes back to bar in his third stint may reach out to the minorities in a new way be more inclusive now we will see whether that happens or not okay. but uh uh i would say certainly i look at it as pre poll rhetoric which is very sharp this time and which is coming from the prime minister himself so smita prakash how does the bjp and the prime minister then speak to those concerns which nirja choudhury just just articulated that there is a persistent feeling among sections of the minority community that the bjp is anti minorities so two things which nirja pointed out which i would like to uh, talk about um including um uh the other panelists one was about the prime minister making a very strident uh, comment very sharp comment and this is going to get uh, sharper as we get closer mm. to the polling dates the thing is that i don't think uh, the opposition and a lo- large section of the media 
are still able to come to terms with the fact that the Prime Minister is a political animal. We had a Prime Minister for 10 years who was apolitical to some extent, at least vis-a-vis -vis his interaction with the people of the country. He was political in, his, in the machinations that needed to be done within the party and within the cabinet to some extent and many say he was underrated in that uh, respect as a, mm. uh, as a politician. But so what happens is that the media and the people of the country got lulled into this of having a prime minister who is apolitical. Now comes Mr. Modi and rewrites the rules of engagement as far as a prime minister is concerned. He was political, he is political and he will continue to be political and he will lead from the front and which is how he has been and how he has been. And the BJP is not shying away from that fact because as a commander of his <coughs> uh, battalion, he is somebody who leads from the fact from the front. He is artillery as well as infantry as far as the BJP is concerned. So, uh, he is going to continue doing that and uh, the people of India are willing to accept that. It is the people who have been reporting on media and the and the opposition who have to no, come to there, terms there, with there, that. There, there is a, a perception, rightfully or wrongfully, that uh, the Modi government in the last 10 years has not done enough for minorities. For the minorities. Let so me how, come to that how do you, point. How, how, yeah. how does he as speak to those As far uh, as, uh, like uh, Nija said about the cylinder, the cylinder does not say whether Muslim you are a Ruksana or you are a Rupa. You are going to get it anyway. So, some of the Labharti ones, they are going to get benefit. Now, as far as the Muslims feeling something, feeling that, they, they, you know, the lynching or whatever, the point is that uh, a feeling is very difficult to change. To, when you are constantly told that Achha hua masjid gira diya, mandir ban gaya, when you constantly told that and then you try to legitimize it by saying that oh the uh, the uh, the Mughals were not Indian so it is okay to have to brought uh, that the mosque was brought down. These are all uh, academic uh, arguments that are made. As far as the feeling of uh, Muslims are concerned, the point is if their status in life improves, if their way improves. I saw this 20 years ago, 30 years ago when Modi was chief minister of Gujarat. Some of us who have reported from there, the point is if a panwala on a highway, his business improves because Modi as a chief minister built a highway, he is going to think my dhanda has improved. Now the feeling uh, uh, his family feels about it because they go to the masjid and the and the uh, mullah in the masjid tells him that Are, Modi ke aane se tumhara kabada ho jayega. The point is that they are getting more money into their pocket because that panwala is able to bring in more money because of the highway coming there or whatever. So, I am just giving you an anecdotal reference. So, this is what as far as the feeling is concerned, it will take a little while for the Labharti to so materialize. Is this, may I just, it, it, may I just, uh, you just add from where Smita Le left off. You see, I think if you really look at uh, the, what are the sources of the grievances of the minority communities, it is not economic. I think that's one thing we have to rule out. It's not economic. But they have a political problem. Or that is that for the first time after many, many years, the minorities, at least the Muslim community feels, it does not have any political clout in the government. And I think that is, got the reality, that, that is the reality. And now how do you actually fix this issue? This is a difficult one because the BJP is not really dependent on the Muslim vote. Now, if you want, if the Muslims want to make the BJP dependent on their support, then there has to be a tectonic shift in the voting patterns. And as of now, we haven't seen that happening. Yeah. On the other hand, what we are seeing is that on large sections, in, in large parts of the country, the Congress is getting disproportionately more and more dependent on the Muslim vote. This is a, I mean, it's not the Congress's own doing, but th th this is how it's actually working out. Mm. So, under the circumstances, you, you find that the BJP, in any case, would want to raise the rhetoric at the time of the election. And if you look, look at the Prime Minister's election uh, style, not merely uh, since he became Prime Minister, but even going back to the Gujarat time, you will find that there is a pre-election type of rhetoric, which is all about development works and what is being done, etc., etc. And once you come into the election, there is a very sharp 
rhetoric which is about how to mobilize motivate your own committed votes and get them to that and that's a very important st- step in this election because there is a feeling at one level that it is jibya election you know uh, it, it, You know, when, when you have uh, when you have opinion polls like yours <laughs> it says that there, there's no, nothing left for the, there's no suspense left in the election yeah. you've got to motivate the kind you've got to motivate the karyakartas to come out and vote so this all this is playing out in that it's needn't i don't think we need to take this whole question about uh, muslim league you know all all that very serious little come and go and it'll you know this, this is par for the course but the congress is also a little miffed that all its very well trained uh, highly americanized uh, young boys and girls who they've got to make these very social democratic type things in in the uh, manifesto redistribution and all that it's getting no play the progressives in the, <laughs> the progressive aspects of their they want to the, they, 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 so they, they want to be the left. Left. that up mohan is probably one of the progressives they, they, they want to be the left <laughs> of the american democratic party mohan, that's what the model is le- your further left of the us democratic party <laughs> <laughs> Coastal elite. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't say many of that. I've been on the ground for ten years in Salem in Tamil Nadu. So, but yes, I mean, I, I mean, I speak sort of uh, English uh, pretty fluently. So you could put me in the progressive. I don't mind being called a progressive either. Now, Swapan is right. Actually, one of the things I was going to mention that he did was that there's no representation. They're not even candidates, right? I mean, you went through the whole Karnataka election without a single Muslim candidate. There's also the prime minister's own utterances at different points in time. when he said that you know i can recognize who the criminals are in a riot by the clothes they wear or mr yogi adityanath saying that you know i don't want 20% of the vote these sort of snide utterances that help to polarize the election and it's all fine to say he's a political animal and you know hey this is what he's going to do during the election the rhetoric is going to get sharper but this is very divisive and if the man is now larger than life and he's definitely going to win this election then why continue to divide society along these lines and i'll tell you one thing else zaka you know I, i'll use this as an example before Ma- mayawati first became a chief minister in uttar pradesh you could ask the dalits there when they went to the police station how they were treated today if you ask a young muslim boy if he goes to a police station in up how he's treated you will get a real response on what's changed for them in their life but, but more and that's the, the, the flip first side, point for a normal person the, once the, again that's the first point for a normal person how their lives change when the air around them when the environment around them Changes. But, but the flip so side the, to that argument is the, the flip side to that argument is as as Swapan Das Gupta said a moment ago, what happens to the Congress Party? You are today, for better or for worse, considered a party that is dependent on twenty percent of the vote. Not really, because Swapan answered his answer that question when he said that he's basically preaching to the converted. How many times are you going to try and pull that same trick out of the bag and hope that the same people will vote for you? there's we believe there's only so much there's only so many gains to be made in polarizing the vote they've already got there i think the issues that will dictate this election are really issues that matter to the livelihoods of people that's okay. why we are talking more and more about unemployment we're talking about inflation we're talking about how we put money back into people's hands so those are the issues that we are focusing on we- they can continue to do their hindu muslim politics but like i you know they're preaching to the converted when, it's not going when to you go out that 20% vote that they have for that okay. reason okay when when you go out into the field nidja choudhury do you get a sense that the rhetoric is increasing on communal issues polarizing issues and that's what that's why mr modi gets reelected or is it that he's managed to create some kind of a constituency a welfare constituency a labharti constituency call it what you want uh, at the at the bottom end of the pyramid and at the top end of the pyramid he's got you know national security desh ka naam roshan kiya uh, and all of that at the top end of the pyramid so he's built as they say a rainbow coalition of uh, voting communities sections of people across strata who are voting for the bjp and who are perhaps voting for modi more than they are voting for the bjp no points i want to make here i agree with you i think the prime minister did not have to do this that's my personal view because the issue in this election is narendra modi and it's all the things that you have put there you know uh, uh, it, it, that adds up to narendra modi it is what he's done on the world scene of course he is hindu hriday samrat that's a given in fact i have had stray voices in up say ye hindu muslim bahut ho gaya you know they are voting bjp but zyada hi ho gaya humko rehna to inke sath hi hai but uh, national pride labharti 
being a you know 24 by 7 leader no family in tow uh, appealing to the aspirational young india in a big big way now so uh, uh, to my mind he didn't have to do this modi remains and people will vote for him because it is the kind of delivery what he is the leadership that they like and the other side will vote because they're dissatisfied with him you know so he remains the center point but the other point i want to make to do through his manifesto is reach out to a new constituency whether they'll succeed or not is a different thing whether they'll take years to succeed is a different thing and that is the obc obcs have never been part of the congress's constituency maybe you know in uh, uh, southern states maybe when devrajers was there indira gandhi won in 1978 leave that aside certainly all over north india which is their main challenge it was upper caste dalits and muslim but they by insisting on the caste census by talking about doing away with the cap supreme court and given cap for 50% of reservation yeah. no more by promising that they will have reservation in the private sector and then of course going for women as a major constituency which they've been doing over a period i think uh, at least they're getting their direction right whether or not they will succeed is a different thing but but, they, so but then the, the, the counter to that argument is also a, a, a plan to repeal the caa they also have a plan in the manifesto to re repeal article 370 of the constitution so basically the issues which you you tell me you're offering these issues to, to the bjp to the bjp and it it will bjp yeah. these are loose balls the bjp is Gets going to toss. hit them out yeah. of the yeah. stadium they're going to pick one issue after but, the but, other. but, but will. how how does one speak to and i'm sure you, both of you must have seen this piece uh, rushu sharma has written this for the financial mm -hmm. times saying basically what's happening in india is what happened in the southeast asian countries it through the 50s 60s and 70s people are willing to trade economic prosperity economic upward mobility with a a decrease in freedoms that is ruchi Th i mean must, that's his that that's is, his view that is a perception of certain people it's a very trendy view which is there in a certain western thing that we've give, given our freedoms away I don't think our freedoms have been given away. I think people are combative as usual. They are pugnacious. They are still fighting it out. It There's is, a slugfest night, going on. Every, every night, night coming on is. TV and <laughs> saying that freedom of the press has been stifled can only be done in a free democracy. Every night you will have people coming on channel after channel saying media is muzzled. muzzled. You know, to come back among the about the caste thing that you mentioned and what Nija also said is that the OBC uh, category, the reason why. Why regional parties came about? Why do you think Mayawati's party came about? Why do you think Akhilesh's party, Mulayam Singh? Several reasons. And in Uttar Pradesh, if they turn around and say that we don't need this divisiveness, I think this is because uh, uh, the gen there are two generations of voters now who have forgotten the political instability of Uttar Pradesh. How? every chief minister since the 70s could not complete the tenure there was president's rule you have what 15 or 16 chief ministers who did one year two year till yeah. till, till it was akhilesh yadav who came in and he's the first one who had for a full five year tenure otherwise there was nobody so you know when you have the luxury of political stability then you turn around and say ha we want peace and we want stability and stuff like that they've got used to the stability the other point is about whether um, you know uh, 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 modi uh, having said about logon ke kapde pehen ke and that is divisiveness what do you think rahul gandhi did when he said caste what is your caste when he asked this uh, the, the reporter. reporter out there and he said that if, what is the caste of your owner so you know when you when you are bringing about caste that's not divisiveness when you bring about religion that is divisiveness when you have jairam ramesh saying caste is a is an uh, is a factor in india which you can't ignore so is religion in that matter we have been divided in this country on the basis of caste and religion either you face facts and you accept it or you decide that you're going to erase the two so See, also so stability and i think we must actually take stability into account you know we we've taken it for granted that we've had a after 25 years in 2014 we got a single party with the majority yeah and it was after the, those horrible days of the united front etc when you know completely dysfunctional 
and we sometimes feel that you know okay we've really experimented enough with stability it's a bit of a bore it reminds <laughs> me once of uh, what, what, what someone told me about, about the 1984 election when they went to camp uh, when they went to amethi and asked the congressman bhai ya, ya kya ho, ho hai? and rajiv gandhi was the candidate so he said bhai jeet to jayenge lekin haar jaye to maza aa jaye <laughs> Oh, goodness. <laughs> so it's that perversity sometimes which comes on. So, so manifests Mangla, itself. When, when, when you say Mr. Modi makes it divisive with references to Muslim League, etc., when Rahul Gandhi is asking a, a reporter, Tumara Malik ka naam batao, obviously the references to caste, how is that any less divisive? I mean, if you choose to see representation as divisive, if you choose to see reservation as divisive, then yes, I, I guess it is divisive. Unfortunately, the constitution and I think most Indians don't think that way. They think of reservation as something that's required to correct historical wrongs that have happened in the caste system. So I don't see it the same as saying people of a particular religion are rioters or have committed crimes. I'm surprised Smita has made that analogy. I also have to correct Swapan when he says that we said we'll repeal 370. There's nothing in the manifesto that says that. In fact, it says that we will ensure the statehood of Jammu and Kashmir is restored as soon as possible. So no, no, he was referring to the please, BJP manifesto over the over the last many decades, which had a line saying we'll. Oh, I thought he said that our manifesto no, 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 right, says okay, that we will okay, bring back. Okay, okay I stand corrected. I stand correct. Okay, okay, all right. Also, okay. when you talked about Mr. Manmohan Singh saying that minorities have the first rights, you forgot to mention that he also talked about scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in the same sentence. So what he talked about really was all disempowered, voiceless, downtrodden need to have the first right on our resources. And there's no debating that. No, but Mohan, I come back to the point. Again, what all of this is doing, again, whether knowingly or unknowingly, is it cementing the perception that the Congress today is a party of the minorities? Whether it's, again, to use your own analogy and what you said of Manmohan Singh, you've become a party that's dependent on, you know, socially uh, 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 disadvantaged minorities or, you know, commonly disadvantaged minorities. Ultimately, the majority of this country seems to think that you don't speak for them. Is the majority of this country not OBC, SC, ST? Uh, on what basis are you saying that those they're minorities? You just said I mean, you just said that Manmohan Singh Manmohan Singh said minorities in the SCST's same breath as he said minorities and SCSTs and he was, when he said that he was talking about economically underprivileged the downtrodden they should have the first right basically he was talking about poor, the poor people of our country and there's nothing wrong with that I'm sure the BJP will have no objection to that statement if they read the entire in the statement in its entirety okay. how are you saying that's not the majority the majority of our country is still living under the poverty line. Unless you, of course, you know, try, believe the multi-dimension poverty nonsense that's been put out there by the BJP, who's trying to convince us that less than 5% of our country is poor. So, you know, I, I'll give the final word to Nirja Chaudhary. There, there is an argument that the Congress is also putting forth, right? Mr. Modi has been in power for the last 10 years. Why is he not running on his record? Why does he have to resort to Muslim League and this and that, all the divisive non-issues, instead of saying that, look, this is my 10 years, you had UPA 10 years before that, you decide which was better. This is only a reaction to the Congress manifesto. manifesto. It's not their manifesto, for heaven's sake. Nidhya Chaudhary. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that because as I said, he is the issue in this election. And I, I feel he did not have to. I mean, it's all right for a, one BJP leader here and there to talk about it like that. But for the Prime Minister, he did not have to. Because at the end of 10 years, he remains as popular. There has been no other Prime Minister India has had who's remained popular at the end of 10 years. Nehru won the election in 1962, but was losing ground, was frail, was not the old Nehru. And Indira Gandhi routed after 10 years. Manmohan Singh, in two, from 2004 to 2014, the third Prime Minister who did 10 years, the grand old party slumped to just, just over 40 seats. And Narendra Modi at the end of 10 years is popular. So I think... He did not, I personally feel he did not have to do this. Okay. Job. To or, win an election, you need to do all kinds of things. As I'm they just say, Sam, Dam, Dhan, yeah. Okay, we'll leave it at that. We'll see how this story plays out, whether it resonates on the ground or whether this is going to be confined to the TV studios and the political rhetoric of the campaign. But what we're going to do now is to take a quick break and talking about political rhetoric. There's a full-fledged political clash now that's erupted in Hyderabad after the MIM chief, Asuddin Ovesi, he visited Mukhtar Ansari's family and after that, he is now claiming that he's receiving death threats. 
His main rival in the seat of Hyderabad, the BJP's Madhvi Lata, is accusing him of siding with radical elements and that's why he's getting these death threats. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have that story and a face-off between the MIM and the BJP on that story. That's right after this quick break. you see this uh, you know this this change is some sort of an irony your grandfather who's an iconic figure his history and his legacy deeply rooted in the struggle of the farmers your decision of you know aligning with the bjp also comes against the backdrop of simmering discontent in the farming community against the present regime and uh, the main demand that you would uh, also know is of of course the rising sugarcane crisis but predominantly pan india it has been to give a legal guarantee on msp do you feel in some sort of a way a little conflicted with aligning with a party and also having to you know be the torch bearer of See, not the farmers all. community because you are a very recognizable uh, we, face amongst that community as well i understand your question we have to engage with the policy makers at least today when there are farmers you know who have their demands they are able to put it to government people in government people in bjp should not feel ki hamare dushman hai and they do not feel like that coming from the inside from sharing my perspective or what i have you know sat through with them in meetings their perspective it's not that they have any adversarial attitude towards farmers they recognize the contribution of farmers and they want to do more for that community for agriculturists did you feel the same when you were in the opposition of course see government will take decisions some of them are good decisions they're providing direct support 6000 rupees direct to everyone whether whatever your caste is where you come from you're hindu or muslim doesn't matter you're a farmer that has been recognized straight to your account government is providing some support maybe meager may not be what is required but it is a commitment and therefore even the bharat ratan decision in a way it recognizes the spirit of this government and the approach so not at all i am not putting any uh, you know it's not with a heavy heart i have taken this decision i have taken it with a lot of hope and farmers of this country must have hope the third regime and the third term that we are seeking thrice and big mandate we are going to the people with Yes. If we get that mandate, definitely a lot of good will come out of that. And and do you feel that being in the government would perhaps enable you to address those grievances of the farmer? Being that will being be the attempt. That in is in an the, alliance with a government that is in power. You feel that would. That is you? our sole purpose. Okay. That is our uh, unequivocal. I'm I'm saying it openly. That is our sole purpose. That is why if we are in government. we are there for a reason jenji i was in uh, i spent a lot of time in bagpat and also in other adjoining areas in saharanpur uh you have two seats from where your party will be contesting bijnor and bagpat it, both these places have a sizable muslim population bijnor uh, especially 5 and a half lakhs plus uh, 3 and a half lakhs if i'm not mistaken now um about the citizenship amendment act the opposition has been extremely critical of the same they have been saying it's discriminatory divisive against the constitutional ethos i want to know your stand your party stand your party stand as you go into the elections in those these two places because when i was speaking to the community in bagpat at least they of course say that they would goes to the rld uh, they were unequivocally clear about that but yes there were reservations about the bjp as well how does rld sometimes policy measures to build a deeper understanding of what is the intent behind such measures needs to be given time for people at the grassroots to truly understand what it means to them i think ca is one of those issues it's not about denying anyone citizenship as much it is about according rights to people who have been persecuted in our neighboring countries so from a human uh, rights perspective it is a positive move do you see this uh, you know this this change is some sort of an irony your grandfather who's an iconic figure his history and his legacy deeply rooted in the struggle of 
the farmers your decision of you know aligning with the bjp also comes against the backdrop of simmering discontent in the farming community against the present regime and uh, the main demand that you would uh, also know is of, of course the rising sugarcane prices but predominantly pan india it has been to give a legal guarantee on msp do you feel in some sort of a way a little conflicted Welcome back there's now a fresh fight between the BJP and the MIM as the political clash escalates over Mukhtar Ansari's death MIM chief Asaduddin Owaisi visited Ansari's family he demanded a thorough investigation into the death of the mafia don turned politician Ansari died last month of a heart attack in a prison in Banda in Uttar Pradesh but his family claims that he was slowly poisoned in custody Owaisi has said that after meeting Ansari's family he's been getting death threats the MIM chief claimed that evil forces were threatening him and asserted that he's not going to go away so easily Remember Owaisi also remarked about Ansari's death saying that the people of Gazipur had lost their favorite son. Owaisi has also urged the election commission to monitor threatening social media posts. His opponent in Hyderabad, the BJP candidate Madhvi Lata has mocked Owaisi saying that he's facing flack because of the kind of friends that he's making. Madhvi Lata claims that uh, Owaisi's friendship with Ansari is indicative of his links with radical elements like ISIS. Ahead of the Lok Sabha battle for Hyderabad is Owaisi on the back foot in the battle of optics. मुख्तार अंसारी के घर को गया तो उसके बाद से सोशल मीडिया पर ये तमाम के तमाम बांखड़े पहलवान शुरू हो गए तेरे को मार देंगे पहली बात तो जो दूसरों को से देते हैं उनको कौन है भैया देने वाले उनका तो दोस्ती मुख्तार अंसारी जी से है ना देखिए तो सही उनके दोस्ती क्या लेवल पे है Rajnar Reddy is spokesperson of the Telangana BJP Adil Hasan is spokesperson of the AIMIM uh, Adil Hasan so the Hyderabad candidate of the BJP has said that Mr Ovesi is getting death threats because of the company he keeps agar aap Mukhtar Ansari ke sath dosti nibhayenge to fir death threat to milega hi main asal baat Siberian crane ka koi jod nahi hai madam abhi bhi abhi abhi rajneeti mein aayi hai aur BJP ka itihas to bahut purana hai Yashoda hospital हैदराबाद में है उससे भी चंदा लिया इलेक्ट्रोल बॉन्ड के नाम पर मैडम का भी बहुत बड़ा हॉस्पिटल है करोड़ों अरबों की संपत्ति अब पता नहीं बीजेपी क्या कर रही है क्यों इतना प्रमोट कर रही है आपसे पूछना चाहते हैं भारत में पहली बार अगर किसी ने आईसीस के खिलाफ बोला तो उसका नाम बैरिस्टर असदुद्दीन ओवैसी साहब है अगर पॉलिटिशियन के घर जाने की क्या जरूरत पड़ी लेट मी स्पीक मुख्तार अंसारी लेट मी स्पीक आई एम अलाउिंग यू टू स्पीक आंसर माई क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो ओके 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 तो उसके बाद जब आईसीस के खिलाफ हम बोले लाइव छह गोली उत्तर प्रदेश में बैरिस्टर असदुद्दीन ओवैसी साहब पे चली तो यो, ये तो दुनिया देखा ना कि किस पर गोली चली और राम रहीम को पेरोल मिलता है उस राम रहीम को सिक्योरिटी बीजेपी का ऐसा जो भी बंगाल में बीजेपी को सपोर्ट करता है उसको सिक्योरिटी बिहार में अख्तर उल इमान साहब एम आई एम एल ए है बिहार के स्टेट प्रेसिडेंट है उनको ड्रेप थ्रेड मिला होम मिनिस्ट्री छह छह बार बैरिस्टर असदुद्दीन ओवैसी साहब ने चिट्ठी लिखी आज तक एक सिक्योरिटी नहीं मिली ये तो बीजेपी का है ना जब जब बंदा मेहर बंदा मेहरबान तो गदा पहलवान that he is asking for because he says he's getting death threats and we saw before the last election here in delhi on the outskirts of delhi how he was getting uh, uh, those death threats and there was a car bullet, chase bullet, and all of that bullet, those th- those the those pictures were there for bullet. everyone to see jacob yeah yeah rashna reddy rashna reddy yes yes so so here what is the thing is if mr asaduddin ovaisi is actually and i mean actually getting uh, death threats he should apply in the right manner for getting additional security or for y plus or z plus or whatever it is only when there is a clear and credible danger can anyone actually look into it if there is a clear and uh, 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 credible danger and give that person 
uh, security. So, Mr. Asaduddin OLC, in his own words, has stated that he is getting death threats allegedly in the social media. So, what is the death threats that he is getting? What is the social media message that he's got? Where are the specifics? Because Mr. Asaduddin OLC is first to champion anything and anyone who are anti-India. Here, it's not just about Mr. Mukhtar Ansari or what is his religion, etc. It is about their, his, he is a politician, come mafia, come gangster. What is Mr. Asaduddin OLC doing talking to him? or going to meet him and and mr asaduddin ovc has every reason i mean as far as israel and hamas is concerned india took a clear stand and and we said we are not involved however we support humanity we were at that mr asaduddin ovc went out of his way and had a palestine uh, and had a pro a Palestinian rally and a public meeting. No, no, look, that, that, no, 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 ma'am, ma'am, one second. That, 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 he is as a, as a political operative, as a politician, he is free to take whatever position he wants to take. The issue is not that. The issue is he is claiming. You're right. If he is indeed getting death threats, he should apply whatever the right channels are, apply for Z plus or Y plus or whatever security that he thinks he should get because he's getting all of these death, death threats, these credible threats he needs to sort of uh, make the official complaint for that. But who he supports, what issue he supports, what he doesn't support, he's free to support whatever cause he wants to support. It has a, it has a direct relation, I'll tell you why, sir. Here is, the, here is the issue where if he, if he were to apply, that credible threat why perception will be assessed the by the Home Ministry and by the... If he is applying for credible threat, for threat Amish, that Amish. will be assessed first huh? by yes, the required yes, authorities yes, and yes, only yes, after yes, that yes, will yes, there yes, be any... Adil, Adil Hassan sahab, if there is a credible threat, then go to the police station and complain. Jacob sahab. The threat of social media has been given to the threat of social media. How do you know that the threat is credible or not? अगर क्रेडिबल थ्रेट है जाके एफआईआर दर्ज कीजिए अच्छे मोहन भागवत जी को मोहन भागवत जी को जे प्लस सिक्योरिटी किस आधार पर मिला हुआ है प्रधानमंत्री तो भारत में सबसे ज्यादा सुरक्षा 535 करोड़ रुपए खर्च हो रहा है प्रधानमंत्री के सुरक्षा पे किस हो रहा है बीजेपी का जो जो कांग्रेस छोड़कर जो आम आदमी पार्टी छोड़कर जो किसी पार्टी को छोड़कर अगर आज जाता है तो उसको सबसे पहले जेड प्लस फाइव प्लस सिक्योरिटी मिलता है बीजेपी ने आज तक आजाद भारत में सबसे ज्यादा सिक्योरिटी पर जो खर्च हो रहा है बीजेपी के लीडर पे हो रहा है बतलाए की इंटेलिजेंस ऑफिसर क्या कर रहा है आज हिंदुस्तान में मजलूमों की बेबसों की मुसलमानों की दलितों की वंचितों की आवाज है बैरिस्टर असदुद्दीन ओवैसी साहब अगर पहलू खान हो तबेज अंसारी हो अखलाक हो रोहित वनूला हो किसी के साथ भी अगर ना इंसाफी हुई है भारत में अगर कोई नहीं ये ये पॉलिटिकल नहीं नहीं ये ये पॉलिटिकल लाइन क्यों नहीं नहीं ये पॉलिटिकल लाइन क्यों ले रहे हैं आप नहीं नहीं ये पॉलिटिकल लाइन क्यों ले रहे हैं आप आप आपसे आपसे सिर्फ ये कहा कि आपके लीडर के खिलाफ अगर क्रेडिबल थ्रेट है जाके एफआईआर दर्ज कीजिए और जो भी सही चैनल है जाके मांगिए आप सिक्योरिटी ऑफिसरें Uh, sporadic incidents of violence there the bjp is hoping to retain the seat by wooing the rajbanshi community it's a strategy that the ruling trinamool congress is following as well kamalika sen gupta files this ground report from kuch bihar in the first phase of bengal lok sabha polls The most important constituency is Kuch Bihar constituency. Now, Kuch Bihar is a place which is known for the rajas. This was once the capital of Kamta Kingdom, and the Koch dynasty also used to rule from this place.
कुछ बिहार कंस्टिट्यूएंसी हैज सेवन असेंबली कंस्टिट्यूएंसी ऑल ऑफ देम फॉल्स इन कुछ बिहार डिस्ट्रिक्ट देर आर नियरली ट्वेंटी लैक पॉपुलेशन इन दिस कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंसी इन टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन आउट ऑफ दी सेवन असेंबली कंस्टिट्यूएंसी फाइव कंस्टिट्यूएंसी बीजेपी गॉट अ लीड इन फाइव कंस्टिट्यूएंसी इवन इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन वन तृणमूल स्वेप द स्टेट बीजेपी गॉट मोर सीट्स फ्रॉम दिस प्लेस राजवंशी लोग कौन हैं और आप लोग वोट में कितना अहम हो राजवंशी वोट तो 80 परसेंट वर्तमान वी हैव 80 परसेंट ऑफ द वोट बैंक स्टैंड विद अस वी विल स्टैंड विद द पार्टी राजवंशी ममता दीदी हैज डन अ फ्यू थिंग्स रेस्ट नो बडी हैज डन एनी थिंग कुछ बिहार वॉज वंस अ स्ट्रॉन्ग बैस्टियन ऑफ द लेफ्ट बट नाउ इट्स द कंस्टिट्यूएंसी ऑफ एम ओ एस होम निशित प्रमाणिक हु वन फ्रॉम हियर इन ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन इन फैक्ट द बीजेपी मेड मैक्सिमम इलेक्टोरल गेम्स सिंस द ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन इलेक्शन इन द कुछ बिहार रीजन How is the Josh? Josh कैसा है मैं देखिए स्केडूल तो बहुत बिजी है और इस समय में बिल्कुल इलेक्शन की पहले कैंपेनिंग के टाइम पे बहुत ही ज़्यादा कार्यक्रम रहता है लेकिन फिर भी जब जनता जहाँ पर भी जाते हैं जब जनता जब दोनों हाथ भर कर आशीर्वाद करते हैं आम आदमी जब दोनों हाथ भर कर आशीर्वाद करते हैं तो ये जोश जो है ये दिन ब दिन बढ़ता ही जाता है पाँच साल बाद फिर से एक बार कुछ बिहार का जनता वाई विल दे वोट यू देखिए देखिए पहली बात तो ये है कि लोगों को पता है कि कोई भी अगर कोई समस्या लेके मेरे पास आता है तो उसका समाधान होता है और मैं अपने दिल से कोशिश करता हूँ प्रयास करता हूँ उनकी समस्या की समाधान करने का The TMC has fielded Jagdish Bashunia against Nisit Pramanik in Kuch Bihar. But this time around the party is doing everything to gain the Rajbanshi vote. Kya is baar Rajbanshi voton mein bhag hoga? Is baar Rajbanshi log ko ye malum hua ki BJP hamara sath dhoka kiya ebang jhoot bola. Is baar sab Rajbanshi log ekatta sab hota hai ebang agar jitna din jayega वो सब लोग एक साथ आएगा तो यही उनका मुद्दा है जो झूठ बोलता है उसको हटाओ जो काम करता है उसको ले आओ ट्राई टू टॉक टू पीपल दैट वॉट टू दे फील ऑफ द वायलेंस दैट टेक प्लेस इन इलेक्शन ये बताइए कि वोट आने से क्या चीज के ऊपर वोट देंगे इतना जो अशांति आज यहाँ पे बम चल गया कल वहाँ पे गोली चल गया 2021 में गोली चला आप लोग को शांति भी क्या एक चीज है शांति तो वोट चाहिए तो शांति तो वोट चाहिए चीज वी वांट टू वोट इन पीस वोट अश्ले को ना भय लगे वी आर स्केयर टू गिव वोट स्केयर ड्यूरिंग इलेक्शन On 22nd January, when the entire focus of the country was in Ayodhya, Ram Mandi, here in Kuch Bihar, in this area of Rajarhat, another Ram Mandi was also inaugurated. Now, according to the MOS Home Nishit Pramanik, he plans to come up with hundred such Ram Mandis. Interestingly. This is a very new Ram Mandir, which has been formed here, which has been built up here, and more to come. Ram Mandir कब बना और क्यों चाहिए? ये Ram Mandir 22 तारीख को बना है, जनवरी की 22 तारीख में, 
और ये मंदिर जब बना तब जिस दिन से शुरू हुआ था मंदिर बन, बनाना उस दिन से हम लोग बहुत खुश थे बोथ ममता एंड नरेंद्र मोदी दे आर बैटिंग फॉर कुछ बिहार दे आर देम सेल्फ बैटिंग इन कुछ बिहार वॉट विल हैपन विच साइड द विंड विल गो विल द राजवंश इज बी इन दैफ्रन कैम्प और ऑन द अदर साइड दैट आंसर एवरीबडी विल गेट ऑन द फोर्थ जून टिल देन वी हैव टू really wait presented by do you see this uh, you know this this change is some sort of an irony your grandfather who's an iconic figure his history and his legacy deeply rooted in the struggle of the farmers your decision of you know aligning with the bjp also comes against the backdrop of simmering discontent in the farming community against the present regime and uh, the main demand that you would uh, also know is of of course the rising sugarcane prices but predominantly pan india it has been to give a legal guarantee on msp do you feel in some sort of a way a little conflicted with aligning with a party and also having to you know be the torch bearer of See, not the farmers all. community because you are a very recognizable uh, we, face amongst that community as well i understand your question we have to engage with the policy makers at least today when there are farmers you know who have their demands they are able to put it to government the people in government people in bjp should not feel ki ye hamare dushman hai and they do not feel like that coming from the inside from sharing my perspective or what i have you know sat through with them in meetings their perspective it's not that they have any adversarial attitude towards farmers they recognize the contribution of farmers and they want to do more for that community for agriculturalists did you feel the same when you were in the opposition of course i see government will take decisions some of them are good decisions they are providing direct support 6000 rupees direct to everyone whether whatever your caste is where you come from you're a hindu or muslim doesn't matter you're a farmer that has been recognized straight to your account government is providing some support maybe meager may not be what is required but it is a commitment and therefore even the bharat ratna decision in a way it recognizes the spirit of this government and the approach so not at all i'm not putting any uh, you know it's not with a heavy heart i've taken this decision i've taken it with a lot of hope and farmers of this country must have hope the third regime and the third term that we are seeking thrice and big mandate we are going to the people with yes if we get that mandate definitely a lot of good will come out of that and and do you feel that being in the government would perhaps enable you to address those grievances of the farmer being that will be being the attempt that in is in alliance with a government that is in power you feel that would that is you? our sole purpose that is our uh, unequivocal i'm i'm saying it openly that is our sole purpose that is why if we are in government we are there for a reason jenji i was in uh, i spent a lot of time in bagpat and also in other adjoining areas in saharanpur uh you have two seats from where your party will be contesting bijnor and bagpat it, both these places have a sizable muslim population bijnor uh, especially 5 and a half lakhs plus uh 3 and a half lakhs if i'm not mistaken now um about the citizenship amendment act the opposition has been extremely critical of the same they have been saying it's discriminatory divisive against the constitutional ethos i want to know your stand your party stand your party stand as you go into the elections in those these two places because when i was speaking to the community in bagpat at least they of course say that they vote goes to the rld uh they were unequivocally clear about that but yes there were reservations about the bjp as well how does rld sometimes policy measures to build a deeper understanding of what is the intent behind such measures needs to be given time for people at the grassroots to truly understand what it means to them i think ca is one of those issues it's not about denying anyone citizenship as much it is it about according rights to people who have been persecuted in our neighboring countries so from a human uh, rights perspective 
it is a positive move do you see this uh, you know this this change is some sort of an irony your grandfather who's an iconic figure his history and his legacy deeply rooted in the struggle of the farmers your decision of you know aligning with the bjp also comes against the backdrop of simmering discontent in the farming community against the present regime and uh, the main demand that you would uh, also know is of, of course the rising sugarcane crisis but predominantly pan india it has been to give a legal guarantee on msp do you feel in some sort of a Hello namaskar this is first post and you're watching vantage with me palki sharma If you're watching us from india he has a question for you Do you know about your fundamental rights? You learn about them in school and you enjoy them throughout your life whether or not you can list all of them. We are talking about them tonight because India Supreme Court has said that you have a right against climate change. You have a right to climate 